coming up next. We're going back to one of our newest shows on Professor of Rock. You loved it. You wanted another episode. Here it is. This one has us digging deep into the catalog of the world's greatest party band. For this episode, we're featuring five essential tracks that together tell this band's story, including songs about concert car crashes and, you know, rock versus disco. But I'm not telling these stories alone today. No, I'm turning center stage over to this famous foursome's iconic guitarist. And not only is he giving us the inside scoop on these classic songs, but he's also telling us which ones he loves and which ones he hates. It's going to be a lot of fun, so get ready. It's time to learn from the band who taught us all how to rock. Coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies. Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you wondered why the Joker on the Adam West Batman TV show from the 60s had a mustache, you're going to dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the red buttons and the bell and all that kind of stuff so you know when our latest and greatest shows come out, our interviews, we got some good ones coming. Check out my shirt. Chaos Records sent this to me as well. Go check out their store in Covina, California. They're amazing. And also check us out on Patreon to help us keep it a daily channel. So it's time for another edition, another installment of our new series, Evolution. In this show, we tell the story of a band's career through five defining tracks. This isn't necessarily the top five. Each song chosen showcases the evolution of the band's sound and artistic direction. To keep things moving forward, we impose a limit of just one song per album. Though for this episode, I'm kind of cheating a little bit. You'll see why. For today's show, we're featuring the band that taught us all how to rock. I'm talking about Kiss. And you know what? As soon as I started into this one, I knew I was in big trouble. I mean, Kiss formed in the 70s, and they just recently wrapped up their final tour. That means there's five decades of history and material to soar through. It's really overwhelming. So to simplify things, I'm sticking to their first two decades of work or so. And thankfully, I don't have to tackle this one alone. Like I mentioned up front, today we're getting a hand from one of the band members, the space ace himself, Ace Fraley. So there's so much to cover here that I, I'm just going to jump into it. So let's get going. It would be a hard-fought beginning for KISS members Paul Stanley, the star child, Gene Simmons, the demon, Peter Chris, the cat, and Ace Fraley, the spaceman. Over the course of their first three albums, the band struggled to find an audience outside of their live shows, which showcased the face-painted foursome at their very best. Their first trio of albums, including KISS and Hotter Than Hell in 74 and Dress to Kill in 75, all of which put up relatively disappointing numbers. Their breakthrough wouldn't happen until the triumphant live record, Alive, that came out in 75. Obviously, there was some great music leading up to Alive, though, and uh, you know, one highlight that I really got to mention is Cold Gin. Although it's not one of today's songs, let's call it an honorable mention. It's just uh, one of Kiss's best kick-ass tunes. Cold Gin was written in a New York subway by Ace Frehley who said he had never taken a guitar lesson. He had no idea it was destined to become a Kiss classic. In fact, he wasn't at all confident about it. Said Gene, I insisted that Ace should sing the song, but he refused and said that he preferred I sing it. But let's hear from Ace himself about Kiss's beginnings. Here's what he told me. We started performing at this club in Long Island, New York, called The Daisy. And, you know, once we got the name and we started you know, and we, had, Paul and Gene had written a lot of songs. I don't think I had written anything at that juncture. And uh, I think we may have done a couple of covers. I can't remember. But what we were doing in this little club was developing the makeup that we were going to wear. I mean, one night I walked out on stage my, with my whole face silver. I mean, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> And, uh, and then one night I got serious and I, I decided to do these cool stars, silver stars, you know, outlined in black and black makeup. And, uh, you know, Paul used to do, ha he had the same makeup back then that he has now. The only difference was originally he had a circle around his eye, you know, like the dog from the Little Rascals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And one night I said to him, you know, why don't you try a star? 
it would be a little more interesting. And he tried it, and I don't think he'd ever give me credit for designing his makeup, but uh, that's what <laughs> happened. Wow, very cool. That's what happened, and I'll swear on a stack of Bibles on that one. Okay, so for our first song, we're going with a rock and roll all night. Without question, this was Kiss's breakthrough hit, the song that shook everybody out of their comfort zone. Initially featured on 75's Dress to Kill, Rock and Roll All Night later found its success on Alive. It climbed to number 12 on the Hot 100. It's the song that has defined Kiss's musical identity. It's their calling card track, a manifesto, an anthem for Kiss fans to rally behind. Written by Simmons and Stanley, this all-out rocker helped Alive sell 3 million copies in short order. From then on, it was clear that Kiss was here to stay. I don't want to say too much about this one. Rather, I want to go to Ace's perspective. So let's turn it over to him. We decided to bring in 25, 30 people, you know, there, you know, the president of my album company, Neil Bogart, you know, all, all the people from the record label, friends, you know, I, I can't remember all that, all the people that were there, but they, you know, we had the song already recorded. They played it through the speakers and everybody just sang along. They set up like four or five microphones. And we had all these people singing on, on the chorus. And that's why you get that group uh, chorus effect. Because so many people are singing. Night, ever, day, so coming into 1976, and this is where I'm going to cheat a little bit. You'll see what I did here. I think you'll be okay with it. So much good stuff in Kiss's catalog. So I'll call this one 2A and 2B. It's Detroit Rock City with Beth on the flip side. That's how it was in real life. You gotta lose your mind in Detroit Rock City. I to you. I think I hear. Paul Stanley began writing Detroit Rock City as a party style tribute to Detroit's uh, music scene. It's gonna be a sex song. When producer Bob Ezrin heard it, he steered Stanley in a new direction. And ultimately, the song became a haunting rocker based on the story of a fan who was killed in a car accident on his way to a Kiss concert. Beth, on the other hand, was really a departure for the band. Sung by drummer Peter Chris, uh, the band didn't even show up to the recording studio. It was released as the B-side to Detroit Rock City. It really sounded like it came from another planet compared to the rest of their catalog. But radio stations preferred Beth over Detroit Rock City, and they started playing the song. And uh, Beth became the A-side, the new A-side, and uh, they were so intrigued the song rose to number seven on the Hot 100. But reportedly, some of the band members hated the song. Was Ace one of them? Well, I'll let him tell you. Calling. Oh, Beth, what can? I always loved the song. I thought it was a beautiful song. I thought Pete, Peter did a great job on the vocals, you know, and Bob, most of it is Bob Ezrin playing piano. Beth, I hear you calling. I, I love the song. I, the only problem with the song was that it wasn't in character with the rest of the songs we played. Yeah. And that was probably what Paul and Gene were thinking if they didn't, if they was made statements like they didn't like the song. But I, yeah, I thought, you know, a good song is a good song. I don't care if it's classical, country, or hard rock, you know. If you got a good song, you know, people are going to like it. So 1978 brought us a unique moment in both KISS history and rock history. All four members of the band simultaneously released four solo albums. Each was actually marketed as a KISS record. Pretty cool, right? Uh, it's a great story, and I'm going to circle back to it a little later. But in the meantime, let's jump ahead to 1979. This is when KISS released their seventh studio album, Dynasty. For good or bad, uh, fans got their feel of disco on this one, thanks to the lead single, I Was Made For Loving You. I Was 
Was Made for Loving You was actually Kiss's most successful song on the Hot 100 that wasn't a ballad. And uh, I believe it's their biggest in the digital era, the most streams. Coming in at number 11, during this time, a lot of bands were infusing disco into their sound to stay commercially relevant. Rolling Stones, Rod Stewart, Pink Floyd, Queen, everybody. It was happening pretty much all over, and Kiss was no exception. Here's what Ace told me about this song and the era of music. Turned out to be a big hit, just like I was made for loving you. I hated that song. Because <laughs> I didn't like disco. And I just, I, I was looking at, uh, watching a video the other day of Vinnie Poncia talking about him and him and Paul working on I Was Made For Loving You. And uh, it became a huge hit because at the time, disco was really big. But I really didn't, I, I kind of felt betrayed. I think a lot of our fans felt betrayed that Kiss did a disco rock song. Yeah. Because we're known for being a, a hard rock, heavy metal band. And uh, it was such a departure from that, that uh, some fans didn't like it. The one thing I hated about the song was I used to have to go thicka, 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 thicka. and halfway through the song, sometimes my wrist would tighten up because I'm just going thicka, 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 thicka. you know, and the only time I get a break is when I break into the guitar solo and then Paul switches to the part that I was playing through the song. But uh, besides that, I, I didn't like the I didn't like the fact that we were doing a disco song. I thought it was not in character with the band. Be that as it may, it turned out to be a huge hit. So what the hell do I know? <laughs> <laughs> I want to see it in your eyes. Okay, with our next song, Kiss really shook things up, sporting a new look in more ways than one. I'm going with Lick It Up, the title track to their 1983 album. Now, by this point in Kiss's history, the lineup was missing two of its iconic members, Peter Chris and Ace Frehley. Uh, Peter left in 1980 and Ace went in 1982. Filling in the gaps were Eric Carr on drums and Vinnie Vincent on guitar, but that wasn't the only change. With the release of Lick It Up, Kiss also took off their makeup and their costumes for the very first time. It was a monumental moment for sure. On the album cover, the guys look like four normal 80s rockers. They also did promotional appearances with their naked faces, stirring up a lot of publicity. It was a brilliant ploy designed to ramp up album sales, and it worked. Lick It Up went platinum. Big hit after a few uh, stinkers. Once again, written by Stanley and Simmons, Lick It Up is about living it up in the bedroom. Teaming with uh, sexual innuendo, Paul Stanley sings from the perspective of a guy who wants to make the most of his opportunity. Don't want to wait till you know me better. Let's just be glad for the time together. Let's just be glad for the time together. Lick It Up actually did pretty poorly on the Billboard Hot 100. It stalled at number 66. In the UK, it pretty much had that, reaching number 31. But across the board, it didn't make much chart noise except in Argentina, where apparently they loved the song and went to number four there. Like I said earlier, Kiss has had a very long career, so long it's all but impossible to capture their evolution in just five or six songs. So I opted to focus on their first two decades of work. And capping things off from this era, there's no doubt their final evolution track has got to be forever. This one was released in 1990 as the second single from their 15th album, Hot in the Shade. At this point in Kiss's career, Bruce Kulick was now on lead guitar, and the band was also tapping into you know, outside songwriters, including famed wordsmiths Holly Knight and Desmond Child. But for forever, Paul Stanley teamed up with maybe the most unkiss-like partner that you could imagine, the flowing Fabio hair of Mr. Michael Bolton. Uh, a singer-songwriter best known for adult contemporary fare like How Am I Supposed to Live Without You and Percy Sledge uh, covers. You? But you do have to give Kiss credit 
and I guess Michael Bolton. Michael Bolton? That's me. Partnership actually worked and the timing was right. Actually, I have a full episode on it uh, that I'll link to below. It channeled the band's softer side like they had with Beth, but Forever was a bona fide Kiss comeback hit. It reached number eight on the Billboard Hot 100. I mean, the last time this band had broken the top 40 on the Hot 100 was in 1979 with I Was Made For Loving You. So this was a long time coming. The musical climate was perfect for Forever. I mean, this was the era of Guns N' Roses' patience and extremes, more than words, poison, every rose has its thorn. When rockers could strip down to acoustic-infused ballads and still grow their audience. Rock radio and MTV ate it right up and Kiss made the most of it. Forever. Make no mistake, there's still decades of history to tell. You know, they had 20 studio albums, 13 live albums, 14 compilations, and something like 60 singles. Plenty more to say here, but since Ace Frehley is today's featured guest, I want to come back to his story. Now in his 70s, Ace has lived a lifetime of rock. His career within and without Kiss has been prolific and phenomenal. His time with Kiss spanned over a decade and a half and includes a total of 16 studio and live records. And as a solo artist, he's released eight studio albums and two more of Frehley's Comet. But you know what? Out of all the Kiss solo albums dating back to 1978, Ace boasts the most successful record of them all, his self-titled September 1978 release. It went to number 26 on the Billboard 200 and certified platinum in the US. So here's what Ace told me about this first album that outsold his bandmate solo stuff and about his new record, 10,000 Volts. As we get into the last part of this, I wanna thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses I always wear. Zenny is always running incredible promotions on frames and you can choose your own style and look. Just click on our info button right up here to get yours today. Today for the best prices. Well, 1978, you dropped your first solo album, and I recall hearing that you got the motivation to do a solo album when you were in a band meeting with Paul and Gene, and they made some kind of a sarcastic remark to you. Tell me about that. Oh, what they, what they said to me was, the way they said it, it sounded like I wasn't able to do a solo album on my own. So that you know, they said, Ace, if you need any help, don't hesitate to call us. As if I wasn't capable of doing a solo record on my own. And that just fed that just, you know, made me want to make a much better record. And in the end of, of in all the end <laughs> all the KISS solo records, it's the biggest KISS solo record. That had to feel pretty good. I showed them. <laughs> <laughs> Did you yeah. ever get props from the guys in Kiss after your album was so successful? Shane would never admit it. Shane would always say his record sold more. Yeah. Yeah. Those, it was hard for those guys to compliment, like, compliment me. And uh, I don't know why they were like that, you know. It was, uh, they never wanted to give me credit where credit was due. Uh, they always tried to hog, hog the spotlight when we were performing live. And uh, I had arguments with the uh, video director. Yeah, I go, look, when I'm doing a guitar solo, I want the camera on me. I don't want it on Paul shaking his ass. And... Uh, <laughs> Those, you know, that should happen. Well, whoever I wrote all the songs with, I mean, it was great and it was a lot of fun. But none of that, none of that compares to, you know, working with Steve Brown, my current co-producer. I mean, for some reason, when me and Steve got together, it, magic happened. And I can't even verbalize it. Uh, all I can tell you is, you know, when me and Steve get together and start working on a song, you know, magic happens. And the song turns out to be way better than it originally started out as. Moon, 
with the fact that I was a huge influence on Steve when he was younger. And his two favorite guitar players were me and Eddie Van Halen. So, yeah, you know, he, he got a chance to work with his idol. So, you know, he was humble in many ways, you know, but wasn't afraid to tell me I'm wrong either, which I appreciate because I don't want somebody like a, I don't want a lap dog. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? One or two songs, you know, didn't have bridges. Yeah. And I said, you know, this the songs need a bridge. And you go, no, it's great the way it is. I said, no, it needs a bridge. So I, I'd write a bridge. We'd record it. And then after uh, I wrote the bridge, he'd go, you know, Ace, you were right. You know, you, you have more uh, experience than me as a songwriter. And I tip my hat to you or oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the title track, 10,000 Volts. Tell me about that one. 10,000 Volts, I, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think Steve brought that song to me. And uh, I think all I did was rewrite some of the lyrics and there's the guitar solo. And obviously, uh, yeah, I did all the lead vocals on the record. And I'm very yeah. proud of them because many... Some a lot of people are saying, "Hey, this is some of the best vocal work you've ever done." And I don't even consider myself a, a vocalist, you know. Originally, I started singing uh, out of necessity because I didn't have a lead singer, and uh, you know, with New York groove, I had to sing that because it was a big hit. And... I just, my voice improved over the years. It's crazy. But if you listen to my voice on this current album and listen to the 1978 solo album with New York Groove, my voice really hasn't changed that much. If anything, it's gotten stronger. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to pick up Ace's new record, 10,000 Volts. I'm going to link to it below. Uh, leave us a comment about KISS. What are What is your history? What are your five picks on Evolution Picks? Where did I go wrong? Where did I go right? What are your picks? Um, what are your memories of this band? The first time you heard them, let's have a great discussion below. If you like our content, we, uh, we invite you to be a part of our community. We'd love to have you. Uh, just subscribe below. Until next time, three chords. And the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.